Hello? How are you guys doing? Okay, I'm trying to get this situated so I can... Ooh, Sima. Um, it is like two o'clock and I've had a fantastic day today. I, um, uh, I got up this morning, Alex had to work for a little bit. I didn't even hardly get anything out of there. Um, Alex had to work for a little bit this morning. So I got up and I got a big glass of water after I gave PB his medicine and stuff and I took them outside and then I did a cup of coffee lush mask and put some eye stuff underneath my eyes. I did a face mask before I went, I did a hydrating face mask before I went to bed last night. I did that Neutrogena one that's like $2.49 that you can get like at anywhere, like at Walmart and stuff. I love those. They're like my favorite. I, I swear by them. And um, so I woke up, washed my face, did the face mask, um, did my meditations this morning. I felt so focused and so like centered today when I got up and really, really like I was ready to be productive. And um, Alex has a girlfriend that's in town that he used to work with visiting, that he went to high school with, and then they work together later and stuff. She's really fun. And so she's in town until uh, Sunday night from Dallas. And so they had like arranged a dinner. We were going out to dinner, all of us, tonight at 8.30. So when he came home, he didn't really have anything to do till 8.30, so he just kind of hung out and was watching movies upstairs and stuff. And, um, I, he was watching, it was so funny, he was watching to all the, to, what is it, to all the boys I loved before or whatever, the, the Jenny Han novel that's now on Netflix. Um, and I haven't actually read the book, and I haven't decided if I want to read it before I watch the show. I don't know, has anybody seen the show? I don't, I don't know really how I feel about it, so. But anyway, um, I heard the book is really good though. So he was watch. I think he was watching that. I just got like some of that stuff in my eye. When I touched my eye, that hurt. It's like stinging a little bit. And I'm thirsty. I haven't, um, I didn't stop to get anything to drink earlier. So anyway, uh, and then I filmed videos. I filmed two drama videos. I uploaded my vlog. I did my Peterisms video. I did a booktube video. And then I filmed three extra videos on my Peterisms channel um, for while we're gone. So I filmed eight videos today. Uploaded all of them. Got them all ready. I have a Peterisms video for every day that we're gone. So now I have to start on doing the booktube videos. So I had those ready while we're gone. Um, and I know people are like, well, don't worry about it. Don't film videos while you're gone. I, I love doing this. Like, I... It, it is never to me... Like, I don't want to do this. You know, there are days where it... I, I would say, like, my personal life seems inconvenient because I want to film videos. And so, it's like, how do I fit my filming videos into doing that? But I've kind of got it down pat now that, you know, like... Like, especially, like, on my drama channel, like... If I wait, if I get, if let's say if I have a lot of things to do that day, I don't, I just throw in a hat and I sit down and I make a video. Cause what I've realized is people don't really care how I look. People don't really, you know what I mean? And it, it's really refreshing, honestly. Um, but today I, you know, took a shower, did my hair, um, got some different shirts. So it's not the same shirt in every Peterisms video, but there's some repeats on there. Um, and then Oh, Alex went over to his friend's house. His girlfriend was having a really bad day. She and her boyfriend broke up. So Alex took ice cream over there and it was real sweet. I feel really bad for her. Um, it's kind of a sad situation. Like they broke up not because they don't like each other, but because of distance and he can't move and she doesn't want to move there. It's just sad. It's just like a sad situation. So anyway, Alex went over there and, you know, um, just kind of talked with her and made sure she was okay. And then he came home and he took a shower and I, uh, 
got ready. I had already taken a shower, so I changed. And then we went, or then another friend came, and her husband dropped her off. And, um, because he was like watching the kids. So she went with us. This is like the friend of ours that, uh, we got to dance on stage to Britney Spears with. And so we've like gone and seen Britney Spears with her like two or three. We went Columbus once and Cleveland another time, twice. So, um, and she, I've known her for a long time. She's really cool and her husband's very cool. So anyway, um, I've been trying to get her husband to start a YouTube channel because he is like, well, they're Alex's age. So I think he's 34, 35. And he knows everything from like how to tie a bow tie to the drink, like what drink to order at a bar, how to make an old fashioned, you know, how to make like an original costume. I mean, he knows everything, you know, like the appropriate thing to say here, uh, the, the best gift to buy your girlfriend or wife. And I'm like, you could do, and he is super attractive and um, just very charming and kind of like old school and on top of that his like clothing and appearance are like impeccable like he loves clothes and he dresses like very cool like you know in the fall and winter it's always like tweed jackets and beautiful sweaters and bow ties and he just has this really great style and she does too they're very kind of like 40s fashion modernized if that makes sense and I'm like you need to dude you need to start a YouTube channel people would love to hear your advice on style and you know buying your girlfriend because he's very like alpha it reminds me a little bit of that channel that alpha male guy except he's more he's better looking and I think more charming than that guy but he knows like all those things you know and he's just a really really cool guy um so I'm like, you know, you should start a YouTube channel. He's like, well, I, I think it'd be fun, but like, I don't, well, you know, whatever. And I gave him 50 ideas. He hasn't done it. So anyway, so she went with us and we went downtown and I drove because I was coming back. We were going all to dinner um, and I knew it would be a long dinner. And I was like, they were going to go out afterwards. And I was like, I don't want to go out downtown afterwards. I'm not really in the mood. And so um, they were, Alex was just going to Uber at home afterwards. So we, uh, went to dinner we went to this restaurant called garden table and it's like they have they have a lot of vegetarian and vegan options on the menu it was fantastic it was so adorable inside and there was like how many of us were there so it was alex and i and then our friend that just recently had a baby and her husband so it's four and then our friend that went with us is five. And then our friend that's here from Dallas, six. And her boyfriend is seven. And then another friend of theirs that's eight. And then the friend that's visiting, um, her brother and his girlfriend. So eight, nine, ten. There was ten of us. We had such a great time. We got there at like eight, eight, eight thirty. And uh, we were there till like 11, 10, 45, 11. Cause I got home, it took me like 15 minutes to come home, get home. I took the dogs out and then I did a live stream. And then, as soon as I got done with the live stream, like at 12 o'clock, I thought Alex would be out till two or three. <laughs> this is called getting older. He texted me and he's like, I'm on my way home. And I'm like, you are? And he was like, yeah. He was like, uh, the girl that's visiting, he was like, she and her boyfriend are bringing me home. We're stopping at Insomnia Cookies and then I'll be home. He was like, do you want any cookies? And I was like, no, I'm good. I don't need any cookies tonight. He was like, okay. And uh, I was like, why are you coming home so early? And he was like, nobody wanted to stay out. We like went and had like one drink at this place called Bakersfield and then they were coming home. Downtown was packed and I, I was really surprised because like the state fair is going on. So I thought, I didn't think that it would be like so packed, but it absolutely was packed downtown. I couldn't believe it. And um, so yeah, I just, and the state fair, like, to get into the state fair was packed tonight because we drove by it to go downtown. And, um, but we parked, like, two blocks from the restaurant. It's on Mass Ave, which is, like, real artsy and, like, it used to be, like, the gay street in Indianapolis. But now there's, like, all these, like, upscale, very kind of, like, what you'd imagine, like, Soho kind of restaurants. Very, like, experimental restaurants that are very, very cool and different. Um... It's like where everybody goes, you know, have drinks and lounge. They're very loungy bars. And so it's like that whole strip is like that now. So we parked like two blocks down. I couldn't believe that we found a parking space. 
But anyway, it was just a fantastic day, you know? It's just like so relaxing. I felt so accomplished. I got so much done. Um, I've made my list for leaving for Vegas and I, you know, got so much already scheduled to do while we're there and um, or I mean I've got all my stuff like listed that I need to do before we go we have all of our stuff scheduled to go when we get there too I'm excited and we're like most excited just to, like lay out at the pool take a nap have romantic days you know eat a little salad by the pool maybe or get a late lunch or something take a nap get ready for the evening go out it'll be fun I'm excited I need to go to Nordstrom Rack and get a couple pairs of jeans though. Um, because I have these really cool shoes that I want to take out there. But like I was going to wear them tonight and Alex was like, I don't, I always cuff my jeans because my jeans are too long. So I cuff them up like real big, like the 50s. And they're kind of like, they sit a little bit above my ankle. And um, Alex was like, I don't like those jeans. With They're like penny loafers. I showed them in a video. Alex is like, I, don't, I didn't, um, I don't like the way that those jeans look like with that sho those shoes. He's like, I love the shoes and I love the jeans the way you do them, but I don't like them together. And he's like, but you could wear them with shorts. And I'm like, but I didn't get them to wear with shorts. I got them got to wear out. So I either have to have like a going out shoe, which is now too late for me to get that. Um, I don't know. I got to just go look at some stuff this week. So I'm going to do that. We don't have tomorrow. I can't do it tomorrow. So I'll have to do it Monday. Tomorrow, um, we're either going to get up and go to brunch, and then I'm going to do the live stream for the book club at 4 o'clock, or we're gonna, I'm going to do the book club at 4 o'clock, and then we're going to go to the fair afterwards and meet Melissa and Jason there. So, I don't know which one we're going to do yet. I don't, Alex is like, I don't really care about going to the, he was, I said to him, I go, do you really care about going to the fair? He's like, it's, I'm going for you, babe. He was like, you know, I don't care about the fair. And, um... I always get real sad when the fair ends because I always, like, I love going. But I don't even know that I care this year. It's just like, is it because I think I'm going to be sad about, you know, like, do you ever ask yourself these questions? It's like, do I feel like I need to go because I go every year? And we haven't, but we haven't been for like two years. Like, I have a different chapstick in my car. The Sephora one, so I had it in my pocket to go out. Um, the Almond Sephora chapstick lip balm, lip balm is fantastic. $12. It's kind of matte. Like a matte material, like a matte ingredient. I love it. So, I don't know. I think I kind of rather just go to brunch with my husband and then come home and do my live stream and then film videos if I do it. We'll see. I don't know. I might try to get up, film my videos, take like take a shower, film my videos, and then go to brunch. I probably won't do a booktube video tomorrow since I'm doing the live stream. So, that won't be hard. Ah. What else? Let's see. Um, yeah, that's about it. I'm kind of ready to, like from the book club, like move on to some new books. Like, we took a hiatus and we, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I even have talked about this on here, but we took like a hiatus from the book club and prolonged it. And um, we're actually going to take a book out, I think. Mel, who's my assistant on my book club, she and I talked about it. Because Lace by Shirley Conrad, I like looked online and it's really hard to get. And so um, I think it might be on the Kindle. But a lot of people don't like to read on the Kindle. So I said, do you think we should change that book out? And she was like, yeah, she was like, I don't know. She was like, I just think that a lot of people aren't going to want to read it and whatever. And she's like, do you have a suggestion? And I go, well, I think it's more of kind of a summer book since we're at the end of the summer, you know. But I said, I was going to put Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls on there because I've always wanted to read it. And she was like, I always wanted to read it too. So I said, well, put a poll up. So, oh, I spit the side of my mouth. Damn it. Oh, that hurts so bad. I mean, I've done that like all throughout today and yesterday. So she put a poll up and at the last, she, she texted me and she was like, it looks like Valley of the Dolls is winning to replace it. So we may replace it. But the next book that we read is, um, mm, my cheek is bleeding. I can taste blood. 
We're reading uh, White Trash Zombie by Diana Rowland, which I've heard such great things about. I'm really excited about reading it. I'm really excited to read a book I've never read. Like, the last three books we've read, I like, chances, I don't remember if I read it before. I feel like I did, but I feel like I know so much about it from the other, because I've read all the other Santangelo books. Mm, you guys, that hurts so bad. So, well, I think I've read them all except for, like, Dangerous Child, which is, like, this, the last one. It's called something like that. Or Confessions of a Wild Child. But, um... Mm, all this stuff in Chances seems familiar to me, so I don't know if I read it. Like, I would have read it, like, in ninth or 10th grade. So, I, have, I don't remember, honestly. Um... is coming so fast down here. Oh, it's a pickup truck. It's like... I'll flash my brights and let you hear that. Um, so anyway... And then I read Lucky, which I just finished, and Endless Night before that. But like all three of them, I knew the stories or I had read them, so... I'm ready to read some stuff. I'm not going to put any more books that I've read before on the reading club list. It's going to be all stuff I haven't read before. And that's why I wanted to take Lace off of there. I've read Franny and Zoe, which we're reading this fall. But I haven't read it since I was in high school. And I don't really remember it very well at all. And um, high school or college was the last time that I read it. I think I've read it like once or twice. I remember Franny, that part, because it's like a book and it's like two stories about a brother and sister named Franny and Zoe. I remember Franny's story, kind of. I remember her like sitting at a restaurant on a day at a college campus, but I don't remember Zoe's story at all. So, um, I'm excited to read that again. And then Slaughterhouse Five. I've never read a Vonnegut book. Can you believe that? I live in Indiana, where Kurt Vonnegut is from, and I've never read a Vonnegut book. And it was my mother's all-time favorite author, hands down. Kurt Vonnegut was her all-time favorite author. And God bless you, Mr. Rosewater was her favorite book, which I think is the sequel to Slaughterhouse Five, or it's the one that comes after. I think you have to read Slaughterhouse Five first to read that one to understand it, which is why I'm reading this. So I'm hoping I like him, and I want to read some more of his stuff. We'll see. kept so many of my mom's books and I was kind of like looking through some of them the other day and I was like and some of them are like I don't even know why I'm keeping them like why I don't just get them. and they're so some of them are so old like I don't even think half price books would want them and I don't even know that a library would take them unless like maybe at a library sale or something they're not books that are worth anything so I was like I think maybe I need to you know I don't know take these to the library or whatever. The library has this bin that's like huge for donating books. I should drive over there tonight while I'm vlogging just because I give me something to do while I'm driving and see if they have that bin that to pop because I could start giving away books. I think one night I got so upset <laughs> reading this Joey Graceffa book that was such crap that, and I like Joey Graceffo on YouTube, I really do, but the book was so bad. It was his autobiography at like 22 of my, pic, called My Pixelated Life. It was so corny. I was so pissed I bought the book that I think I drove right over there and just threw it into this like big thing they have. It looks like a dumpster with like this thing on it that you can like donate your book, so. Oh my God, you guys. go through McDonald's and get a Diet Coke. I've been doing these little Instagram videos. Have you guys seen them? I know they're probably corny. I don't care. I'm having a lot of fun with them and life's about having fun. So, you gotta do what you wanna do. One of my friends was like, don't you get so embarrassed posting that stuff? Like, how do you get like through the embarrassed? I go, get embarrassed? What? <laughs> 
I don't get embarrassed real easy. I don't care anymore. I really don't. You kind of get to a point where it's like, if people are going to laugh at you, people are going to laugh at you, you know? Are you kidding me that this McDonald's is closed? This McDonald's is never closed. Why are they closed? I need a fountain pop. Oh. right here at Speedway, so I'm gonna pull on the Speedway and get something to uh, drink. Uh, while I'm in here, I'll think of some story to tell when I come back, because I don't really have a whole lot to talk about tonight. I'm not gonna end my vlog at 20 minutes. Y'all would be like, this is the shortest vlog in the entire world. I know. So, let me think about some kind of funny story to tell while I'm in here. I'll be back a minute. Okay, I'm back. Oh, my lord. Change oil scent or engine oil change scent. Like I'm always having to get an oil change, it feels like. I need to get my air conditioner fixed is what. So lazy that I haven't done that. Oh my lord. Okay. Story. What story could I tell? I was, I didn't even think about it because I was talking to a lady in there. And I was like, you ready to go home? She's like, yeah. She's like, she, there's this other guy working in there. And he like came in to like replace her. And he said something to her. She's like, she goes, get out of my face. <laughs> And then I went up there. She was kind of, oh my god, I just bit my mouth again. What is going on? Do you ever notice, like, if you bite your mouth once, like, if inside, like, you keep on doing it over and over again? She's like, get out of my face. And he, like, walked away. And she's like, I won't tell you to get out of my face because you're nice, aren't you? And I said, I'm nice. Or something like that. She said, but anyway, she's like, I said, you ready to go home? She goes, yeah, I got to go home right now once I get done mopping this floor. I said, will you be safe on your way home? She said, I'm always safe because I would just live up the street. <laughs> Welcome to my life. This is my life, having conversations with people I have absolutely no idea who they are that work in gas stations. Some of the nicest people in the entire world. Okay, let's see. People like my grandma stories. God, what? I can't. It's another story about my grandma. I told this story about going to the grocery store. remember you know it's interesting like so I knew that my grandfather my mom's dad was a bartender in Indianapolis but what I didn't know was that the bar that he worked at was a bar called Thunderbird and Thunderbird is probably one of the hottest bars in Indianapolis right now and it was a bar that was open like when he would have been alive before he died and he died when my mom was four so that would have been like 47 or 48 he would have died and so he worked at Thunderbird, like, in the 40s, right? Well, we didn't know that. I mean, my mom never said what bar he worked at, but I had his liquor license. Because my mom had found, like, somebody had mailed my mom, like, her aunt had mailed her, like, his wallet that had pictures and all this stuff in it. People say that I kind of look a little bit like him. And, um, I don't see any resemblance whatsoever. But, um, and what's real weird is, like, my aunt, until the day that she died, she would call, um, like, my mom would say our dad and stuff like that, but my aunt would call my grandma mother, and she would call her dad daddy, like, until she died. She'd say, well, like, mother and daddy, um, and I always thought that was interesting, but, you know, like, my aunt would have been six when my mom passed away, um. They did not go to the funeral, my mom said. Uh, sh there was some reason why they didn't go to the funeral. I can't remember what it was, but they had little matching outfits and stuff, and at the last minute, they didn't go, my mom said. She actually has a picture from that day. 
It's weird seeing pictures of my mom as a kid because she looked exactly like she did as an adult in the face. Um, and my aunt did not. Like, my aunt didn't look the same as she did when she was a little kid. I look very, very similar today, too, as what I looked like when I was very, very little. Um, damn it, I was going to show the pictures in here today. That was what I was going to do in the vlog. I keep on forgetting to do that. But my mom, when she got her master's degree in... Okay, I was adjusting the camera and I shut it off. So anyway, um, my mom got her master's degree in uh, education. And, you know, she had to do, like, this really long... It wasn't a dissertation because that's, like, for a PhD. But it was, like, a 25-page paper that she had to write upon graduation. And my mom did it on how bereavement which is, you know, going through grieving, how bereavement affects children in their developmental process. And it was kind of something that my mom was, like, really, really obsessed with her entire life, was reading articles and books about, like, grieving and bereavement. Um, I mean, my mom was reading Elizabeth Kubler-Ross long before I ever heard anybody else talk about death and dying. Um, and she would talk about, you know, the importance of hospice and things like that. My mom had a lot of friends that were hospice workers. And, um... So, she really understood the whole process. It's five stages of grief. That was when that was like really a hot topic. I struggle sometimes believing the five stages of grief. The reason why is because I didn't necessarily go through the stages the way they are. Maybe that's just my experience. I do think that there's a huge difference. I think that stages of grief and how grief affect us is really dependent upon how the person dies as well as their relationship to us. I mean, I think there's many factors that affect it. You know, what their relationship is to us, what the condition of our rela their relationship is when they pass away, um, and how, and the ages as well, you know? So, like, I don't think you can compare the stages of grief to a 10-year-old that's lost a parent to a 50-year-old that's lost a parent, if that makes sense. I don't know, if that, you know, whatever. Um... As well as, like, let's say a 10-year-old idealistically looks up to their father and thinks he can do no wrong, whereas a 50-year-old maybe feels like, you know, oh, I see my dad for what he is and I've been let down, you know, or I have a great relationship or whatever it is, you know what I mean? So I think that the way that we grieve is completely different. You know, I think that, let's say, if a 10-year-old loses a parent to cancer and this person has been fighting cancer for five years through chemo, to a 10 year old, it's like they've lost a parent, you know, like they don't get it, like they don't understand. Whereas I think to some of us, if it was like a family member that was like a parent that was 60, let's say, or 70, yeah, like, you know, we're sad they're gone, but at the same time, we don't want them to be in pain anymore. They've really fought hard, you know, things like that. We can kind of see, you know, some of that in there. So I think the the way, the conditions of our relationship and the ages and things like that really play out differently in the way that we grieve. I just don't, I didn't go through the stages of grieving the way that people do. And like now they've added the stage bargaining in. Or, and I think acceptance, or I don't know. Like, I'm just like, I'm not real into them, you know? I've just never, I didn't go through them like the way that, you know, people say you go through them. But anyway, my mom wrote this long paper. She's very proud of it. She always had a copy she'd give to people and stuff. <laughs> Can you imagine having a friend give you a 25-page paper with citations and everything in it about bereavement, childhood bereavement? So anyway, that was my mom. She was very proud of it. She worked on it forever. And uh, she tried to get it, like, published one time, I think. And it didn't get published. I don't know. But anyway... So, yeah, you know, my mom would talk about that, like, all her life, about how the fact that she lost a father at, you know, four years old, I mean, I don't think many of us really even remember four. I mean, I remember, like, things that happened to me at four, but I don't remember... Like, I, I don't understand the context, if that makes sense to me. Like, and I almost sometimes wonder, do you really remember the memory? Or is it that you've seen pictures or heard stories about that memory? 
One of the things is that we moved um, from our house, or from our apartment to our house, when my parents built the house that I grew up in, <clears throat> when I was four and a half, almost five. And one night my mom and I were talking about the apartment that I used to live in, and I said something to her, and she goes, you couldn't know that. And I said, what do you mean you couldn't know that? And she said, you were too young. There's no way, it was the stairs going up and the way that they went up. And she said, there's no way that you could know that, like how the apartment was. And I said, I remember the apartment exactly as it was. And you came in, the kitchen was to the right. You walked, There was a staircase right at the top where you went up the stairs and then you went around and you came upstairs and you and dad's bedroom was to the left and my bedroom was all the way to the right. And there was a bathroom right off like my bedroom and you guys had a bathroom off your bedroom. And I said the laundry room was upstairs and we had a laundry chute that went down to the basement and there was a full basement that was unfinished and had a laundry room. And she was like, how do you know that? She was like, there's no way you can know that at that age. And I said, I just, I know, I remember it. And um, I told her about the, we had these huge tall windows and all this kind of stuff. So, but my mom was so affected, you know, all her life. She was a very fearful woman. You know, I talk a lot about my mom being wise and... I've talked about mental health issues with my mom, but my mom was really driven by fear much of her life. And there were a lot of things that she wouldn't do. Like my mom did not like to get in elevators by herself. She didn't really like to ride on elevators at all. Um, but my ex and I, my aunt and my cousin all went to Chicago for my mom's 60th birthday. And so my cousin like booked the hotel room and we stayed at the W on Lake Shore. My mom was so excited and she was staying with Caroline and my aunt and my ex and I were staying in a room and we were like a floor above them. Well, like one day we went and I, I was going to take my mom to go like Caroline and my aunt were staying in the room and they were watching a movie. And so I called my mom. My mom's birthday is in November. So it was like freezing outside and it was snowing. It was beautiful in Chicago. And I said, hey, I said, why don't we go walk around? We'll go to the lake. I know you want to see the lake. Caroline and, you know, my Aunt Kathy didn't want to see. They didn't want to walk really anywhere. And I said, why don't we go down the lake? We can go in the Drake because my mom loved the Drake Hotel. I said, you know, we can go in there and have a cup of coffee. We can walk down Michigan Avenue, look at window shop and things like that. She's like, oh, my God, that would be so much fun. I said, meet me down the lobby. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I said, what do you mean? And she goes, you have to come up and get me because I'm not going to go in the elevator by myself. And I said... Why not? And like, I didn't even know this, okay? 60 years of her life, you know what? It was 30, 34 at the time, something like that. I don't know how old I was. I was in my 30s. I said, well, I would have been 32 because she died when I was 36, so 32. I said, what do you mean you're not gonna come down in the elevator? And she goes, I won't be in an elevator by myself. And I go, why not? And she goes, somebody could rape me in the elevator. I go, what? She was like, yeah, somebody could rape me in the elevator. And I do believe in retrospect that my mother was probably sexually abused or raped at some point in her life. Um, my dad really believed that he, she was. And he won't tell me anything more about it, but I have to believe that maybe he knew from like being, you know, being intimate with her and maybe how she responded. Um, Although I really thought that one day I would find out. I mean, this is this is whatever, but I mean, you know, she's gone now. My dad doesn't care. But I thought I would find out at some point that they maybe like only had sex like twice, and then my mom just was really weird about that stuff. And my dad told me that like they dated, like she was like frisky as hell. So you know, I don't know, but. He, he has told me that, like, there were certain situations where she would get so fearful that she would act like a child, and she did. And that actually happened to us on that trip. My, we were at a restaurant one night. My aunt had been drinking, and um, they got into this fight. I'll never forget this. It was so bizarre. It was about... We were sitting there, and um, we were sitting around this table, and my aunt and my mom were in a booth next to each other. And they could literally fight. Like, I mean to tell you, at 60 years old, they could fight you know, 60 and 63 or whatever, they could fight like nobody's business. Like they could, there was potential for a physical fight if Caroline and I did not get in the middle of it. And so we were sitting there and my aunt, you know, is a realtor at the time. And my mom was talking about these condos that she was thinking about getting. And she was like, you know, do they have zero property line? And my aunt was like, I don't know. And my mom was like, and my mom never really could 
ascertain that my aunt had been, like, she would know she had been drinking, but she couldn't really tell, like, how much she had been drinking, if that makes sense. And, um, and I haven't really talked about this on here. I love my aunt, but she could drink. And, um, you know, that comes from that side of the family, so... And I think my mom never really wanted to see it in her. I mean, here my mom is at the time sober, you know, 12 years or something like that, but 10 years, and she didn't really want to see the fact that, like, you know, my aunt, I, she just never could see it, you know? So anyway, they got this fight about zero property line. My mom looked at her and she, real condescending, my mom goes, you're a realtor and you do not know what a zero property line is. And my aunt took her hand and she dug it into my mom's arms with her nails. And she said, let me tell you something. She got like in her face. And my mom started crying at the dinner table. And I mean to tell you, my mom went from 60 years old to about two years old that quick. You're hurting my heart. I mean, it was so weird. And my mom would do that sometimes like in her life. Like she would get so afraid. I've told this story in here before, but like one time I was at my friend's house and my mom called me over. We lived, our house was in the woods and there was a snake hanging from the tree. Okay, my mom is two stories up in a, in a, in a brick house and she made me come home to see this. She was so terrified of the snake and she literally was like sobbing like a child. She was so terrified of the stupid snake. And there was a lot of times like that that my mom would be like so afraid. It was like she would just kind of resort to being a kid. So I had to go get her in this elevator and bring her downstairs. She didn't like to get on escalators. If she could take stairs, she would always take stairs. Just a lot of fear. A lot of fear in her. And sobriety helped that a lot, you know? Her getting sober really helped her become more confident and lose her fears about stuff. But I, that still stuck with her through the rest of her life. And my mom would say, she was like, you know, I really think that losing a parent at the age that I did, and, you know, grandma was very, very poor, and we didn't have any money, and she said, you know, grandma never said we didn't have any money, but I think we knew, you know, like, in comparison to other people, because all these people were doing stuff, and we didn't do it, and, you know, and I don't know. The whole thing is very sad, um, and I think it affected her entire life, you know? My mom had very kind of dependent relationships on men in her life, like my uncle that just passed away. She was very dependent on him. Very, very, very dependent. And the one thing that was weird was that, like, my mom would battle it out with any woman. Like, any woman that, like, talked to her down or talked to her like she was stupid, my mother would put them in their, her place so quick that her head would spin. I mean, my mother owned people. And, but with men, like, my, my aunt could say to her, you know, something like, and my mom would like fight her and they, they would go back and forth. But my uncle could look at, just look at her and be like, Hey, my mom would be like, I'm sorry, Dave. You know, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. Like she would listen to men. Like all, I mean, it was crazy. Like Caroline used to say, the only two people that your mom ever listens to are you and my dad. And it was true. It was like, she trusted men on some level, even though she had all these issues with men. I don't know. Like maybe she blamed my grandma at a young age for like my dad, like my grandpa, like, it's even weird saying my grandpa because I never knew him, you know? I don't know. It's weird. It's weird how those things that, like, you know, this is in my memoirs, that those things that happen to us when we're younger affect us in our adulthood. A lot of things, you know? And it, I don't even think it has to be huge stuff. I really don't, you know? Like... Okay, like, here's an example. When I was growing up, I don't think it'll surprise anybody to know that I talked a lot in class, okay? Um, you know, I always had my little girlfriends in class, and I'd always be whispering to them or whatever. Well, I always got in trouble for it. I was always the one that got in trouble for it. And I've talked about how in fifth grade, my mom let that one teacher have it that put my nose in the gum on the wall outside. I had to stop it because I said the teacher's name and I'm not going to do that to her. But anyway, she don't deserve that. She's probably a real nice lady. Anyway, she's probably not even here anymore. My God, if I was in fifth grade, if I was 10, I bet she was 50 at the time, which means she's 86 now. Can you imagine? Poor little 86 year old woman. Somebody will come for her and be like, you were mean to Peter Mon. And she's like, ew. <laughs> so anyway, but I got in trouble a lot for talking in class, and probably deservedly so, you know? Like, I probably deserved every bit of getting in trouble for it. But anyway, um, as I got older, you know, like, people would hush me. 
Like, I've been hushed a lot as an adult. I used to work with this woman back in the day. And when I would work with her, like, we'd be, like, talking, and she'd be, like, like, hold it down. And I'll never forget, I saw her... And so you have to remember, okay, so now I've been hushed my whole life. Like, you're talking too loud, and I don't really hear it. And, you know, I don't really hear how fast I talk or how much I talk. I just like to talk. You know, I got a lot to say, like my mom said. You know, but, like, I don't really hear it. And my friends don't care. They're loud as shit, too. Y'all met Tanya. She, who cares, you know? But I've had people hush me. And when they hush me, it reminds me of when I was a kid, okay? That, like, what they're saying is... You're an embarrassment. Shut your mouth. You're an embarrassment. That's what makes me feel like. And I shrink inside, right? Well, this woman that I worked with, I was at brunch one day at this, the old Patashu back in the time, back in the very first Patashu that ever opened. And she was there, I think with some like girls that she was like in college. She was like getting her master's degree at the time. Some girls that she was like in her graduate program with or whatever. And I was there with some friends and we were hanging out and I saw her like across the place. Now mind you, okay, this is a restaurant on a Sunday for brunch. It's busy as hell and it's loud, okay? If you guys have ever been out to brunch on a Sunday, those places are loud. And I looked at her and I was like, hey, how are you? And she, I mean to tell you in front of her friends, she, I, I, was, I was gonna say, I was gonna interject what I think, but I'll say that in a second. I was like, hey, how are you? And she went like this. Didn't even wave, didn't say hi, anything. She went like this. I was like, did she just really shush me? But you know what I realize now? She's the one that should have been embarrassed. She's the embarrassment, right? Screw her. <laughs> Screw her. She tried to send me Christmas cards for a while after I left. <laughs> I don't know why I'm letting this get to me tonight. And, um, I had this friend, we used to work, the three of us worked together, and, uh, she resigned from there too, and is, like, working for someplace else now, and, um, we talked, like, so I got Christmas cards, like, the two years after that from this woman that I had worked with since I started there, and uh, we always had this, like, very, like, nice, but, like, I would tell her everything and she would tell me nothing. Have you ever had those friendships? Like, you literally tell that person, like, everything, and then, and then you just sit there and you realize, like, one day you realize, like, you think you have this, like, really open relationship when really what it is is you've been spilling your guts to this other person, right? And they haven't opened their mouth about one damn thing. You know what I mean? But it's, at that point, it's so late, and you realize how stupid you were that you got played. And everything I would say to her, any complaint I would say, she would, like, you know, go and tell a bunch of people about She's such a backstabber. Oh, my God. But because she was, like, Miss Prissy Perfect, everybody believed her. And then, you know, it's just one of those games when you work on a team together. You know, that's why I don't miss any of that. But anyway, so, this other woman that I worked with that I was like really really close with um, <laughs> like two years after I left we were talking on the phone one night I mean I talked like there was like two people that, from where I used to work that I still talk to every once in a while well this one that I'm telling you I don't talk to her very often maybe once a year but the other, there's another one that I talk to sometimes and um, so anyway I said to her I said did you get Christmas cards from so-and-so? And she goes, yeah. We both did not like this woman after we left. Because it all came out. We were like, oh my God. She was like a total backstabber. Like when we started like telling stories, I would be like, let me tell you what she told me that you said or did. She'd be like, oh my God. She did the same thing to you. She was talking shit behind your back. I was like, seriously? I was so pissed. So anyway, so she'd send these Christmas cards, right? And it'd be like pictures of her whole whatever, their family throughout the year and all this kind of stuff and dogs. And he was real nice, you know, she made, she had perfect life, you know, perfect husband, perfect house, perfect, all that bullshit. It was always like one of these like cards, you know, that had like all of it on there. And then there was like a typelet written letter. <laughs> this is so bad. You know, like a typewritten letter about, <laughs> I don't know why this is so funny to me. 
typewritten letter about like, uh, you know, everything that's going on in their life and stuff like that. And uh, I like got the, I had it and I was like in my car. <laughs> And I was talking to my friend on the phone and I was like, did you get the Christmas letter? And she's like, yeah, I just got it today. And we were talking about it and I like had it in my hand while I was talking to her and I go, fuck that bitch. I threw it out the window. <laughs> but what's really funny about it is I haven't gotten a Christmas card since. And I'm thinking, did that other friend tell her that I said that? Probably. People are so shady, aren't they? I want to think I can trust people and then I trust somebody and it's like then they you know what it's just like that's why when I put something out there in the world today I live by st this standard and it comes to bite me in the ass well it's my fucking fault for excuse me for cussing so much it's my fault for putting it out there in the world to begin with you know if I have a friend that goes and tells another friend something I said it's my fault for saying it I can't get mad at them for that and I've done the same thing to people I've turned around and told people things that I shouldn't have that I've been told because that's what we do. We're human. Do you know what I mean? I'm laughing because I'm thinking about Manny Mua's apology video that he just put up because he said in there, it's hard to be human. It is hard to be human. What are our options? That's my question, right? It's hard to be human. Well, okay, what are your options? I don't feel like I have a lot of options. It's like when people talk to me about acceptance and it's like, you know, like I don't like acceptance or I'm really struggling with acceptance. I'm always like, what are your options? <laughs> like, okay, you know, I go to meetings a lot and people bring up acceptance often or they'll bring up life on life's terms, okay? So life on life's terms is like this idea that you have to accept life how it hands it to you, right? So for example, like if your boyfriend says, I don't want to date you anymore. That would be life, like having to accept that on life on life's terms. Or, you know, if your mother dies of some weirdo disease like mine, you know, that's life on life's terms. That's how, what life is handing you. But so it kills me when, I, I understand their struggle, I really do, but it kills me when people say, yeah, I'm just really struggling with life on life's terms today. And I'm like, what are your options? Do you have a magic, you know, wand that you can, like, fix things? I mean, what? Like, <laughs> and through the years, I kind of figured that out. And then I was just like, it's just a little bit easier to work on acceptance faster because it ain't going to change anything. And, um, there's this, like, page in my recovery text this is not an exact quote, because I do not get it right every time, but it's my favorite piece of recovery that I've ever learned. It's not even about drugs and alcohol. You know, like addiction really isn't about drugs and alcohol. I don't know that people really understand that, but it's really, a, it's a thinking disease, not a drinking or drugging disease. And the drink and the drug is really a symptom of other things that are underlying that, which is why we work to use the 12 steps to focus on that, you know? You look at the 12 steps, the only step that has alcohol or, you know, uh, drugs in it is the first step. That's it. And, um, there's this air, there's this part of the book that I love. It's my sponsor of my first year because I was so resistant to everything that he told me to do. I mean, everything he told me to do, I'd say, why? I don't understand why I have to do this, why? He'd be like, do you wanna get better or not? Well, yeah, I wanna get better, but I don't understand, like, just do it. Stop asking me why, just do it. <laughs> one of the things that like, I has been one of the greatest lessons for me in my life is just shutting my mouth, and when people tell me to do something that's better for me, just doing it and trusting the process. Like sometimes like that trusting the process is so hard for me. I have to understand everything about that's gonna happen along the way. But sometimes when I stop like resisting and I just float with the universe and just trust the process, when it comes from people that I trust, that I think they have my best interest in mind, the, the world goes much easier, you know? Every time I touch that stupid thing, I get that stupid melted stuff all over him, over it. So anyway,
I cannot believe I'm gonna be in Las Vegas this week. I am so excited. My favorite part, that I had to read this part every day for two years, but I still don't know it by heart. But I know it, I know it close, which is, when you are presented with things, and, and, and this is a, you have to you have to have some belief in a higher power, okay? Whatever your belief it is in a higher power, whether it's you know, God, Buddha, whatever your your belief, whatever you want to believe, and you kind of have to have that for this to work. But when anything is happening in our lives, okay, and I know people are not going to like when I say that, but when things are happening in our lives that we are really really struggling with, and I really hold dear to this, I have to remember this. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. Um, <laughs> I've already forgotten. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. Um, when I find some person, place, thing, or situation in my life, something unacceptable to me, nothing in my life can go right until I see that person, place, thing, or situation happening that is happening exactly the way that it was meant to be in God's world. Nothing in God's world happens by mistake. And, you know, when I, and it says when I could finally accept my addiction, you know, um, my life started turning around. When I could finally accept life on life's terms, basically. So anyway, and I misquoted the shit out of that, but, um, the whole idea that of acceptance that whatever is happening and I know there are going to be people out there that do not buy into this and want to give me 50 examples of well what about this or what about that or what about this I'm just telling you how it works in my life okay that when something is going on in my life that is unacceptable to me you know whether it's a breakup or a death or a sickness or whatever it is okay I look at that situation and I go okay you got me God and I'm the person that, let me just tell you, when I walked in to my, you know, getting sober, when I walked into the rooms of recovery, if you had said to me, one day in your life you'll be sitting there saying something about, oh God, or higher power, I would have been like, you can blow it out your ass and take your Bible thumping uh, Betty out the door because I don't want to hear it, okay? I don't want it, I don't want it in my face, I don't want to hear it, I don't care. But anyway, today when shit happens that I'm not cool with in my life, I look at it and I go, okay God, you know, you've had me for 23 and a half years now. You haven't dropped me on my ass yet. So I got to believe that there's something, there's silver lining in this somewhere. There's something I'm supposed to learn about this. You know, looking up in the big, middle of the biggest tragedy in your world and saying thank you because you're about to learn the greatest lesson you've ever learned. I really try to stay there and it is so, so hard. I'm talking about real painful moments, okay? When you look at it and you go, I, I, God, I do not know what you have planned for me but I have to believe that you have something planned for me. And I've shared this story on here a lot, but I really love this story. It's, you know, when Oprah Winfrey, uh, before she got cast in The Color Purple, this is really about surrender and acceptance. And she loved the book The Color Purple by Alice Walker so much. And it, she had resonated with her. And she would buy copies and give them to people. You can go, she talks about this. There's an aha moment about Surrender and the Color Purple um, on YouTube. You can go look it up. It's like three minutes. She shares the story. I think the last time I talked about it on here, I linked it below. But anyway, I'll tell it again. She says on there that uh, you know she wanted just to be in this movie. She didn't care if she was a script girl or carry the actors and actresses water and whatever. And then she, got, she uh, auditioned for the part of Miss Sophia. Well, she thought she had it. So anyway... Months go by, months go by, you know, that she doesn't hear anything, so she calls the casting agent, and she says, you know, I just want to know if there's anything on this casting or whatever, and the casting agent said to her, Oprah, I know you're really, and she she said, she thought it was, it was meant to be, you know, that her husband's name in the movie is Harpo, Harpo Studios, Oprah spelled backwards is Harpo, and she just thought all this stuff, would, it like was lined up to happen. And she said, you know, the casting agent said to her, Oprah, I know you really want this role, but there are, like, legit actresses like Loretta Devine that are auditioning for this role. Like, real Broadway cinema actresses, okay? And she'd really not done anything, I think, at that point. I think that was her first movie. And, um, and Oprah said, okay. And she'd been losing all this weight for the role and stuff. And so, or no, she'd been, like, keeping her weight on for the role in case she got it. 
so she went to this fat camp and uh, she was like running around the track or I think she was on a treadmill or a track or something and her assistant came out and said, oh, no, 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 she was on, the, she, so she's running, and as she's running, she was singing, I surrender thee, you know, I surrender all, and as she was singing it, you know, she said to God before she started singing it, I don't know what you have planned for me, God, but obviously it is not to be in the color purple, so whatever you have planned for me next, I'm here for you to do with whatever you have planned for me. And she started singing that song, you know, I surrender all. I love that song so much. If you want to hear it, go listen to CC Winans version on YouTube. Oh my God, it is fantastic. And um, it was so funny because somebody said the other day, maybe I, she said it in a video. I don't think she did though. Can't remember where we were talking about it. And somebody said, what's something about Peter that we wouldn't know to Tanya? And Tanya said, my friend Peter is the guy that can be in a car, laughing his ass off, telling you a story, you know, blasting music, a country music, but then also be crying at, while he's singing gospel music at the top of his lungs. And I thought that was really interesting that she said that. And I do love gospel music, you know? I don't know why. I don't even know how I got started listening to it, but I just did. I started listening to the Winans and CC Winans because... Some of my favorite Whitney Houston music is what she did with CeCe Winans. And I think that's part of Whitney Houston that a lot of people don't know, you know? But anyway, um, so she said, you know, she started singing that song. And as soon as she started singing that song, her assistant came out and said, Steven Spielberg's on the phone for you. So she answered the phone and Steven Spielberg said to her, um, I heard you're at a fat camp. If you lose one pound, you're going to lose the role. And so she went home and she got a Dairy Queen blizzard on the way, she said. But, you know, I, I believe that. Like, I believe that in life we have to stop fighting and resisting. And sometimes acceptance, but always acceptance is the way. You know, acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some situation in my life, I'm, I'm going to pull over and read it to you exactly. Y'all th think I don't keep my recovery textbook right here in my car with me every day? I Listen, I got books in my office, in my car. I got a couple of them in here to give away to somebody that's a newcomer. That's what you do. Keep extra books in your cars. We're like the Mormons. No, we're not. Keep a couple extra books in here to give away to people. And uh, anytime somebody's a newcomer and they need a book, you give them a book. That's what you do. Somebody gave me a book. there, you know. I don't know why that made me. That silly little book saved my fucking life, you know. It's not such a silly little book, I guess. And acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me, and I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my alcoholism, I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. Do you guys want to hear the paragraph that um, 
got me sober. So, I, um, New Year's Eve of 1994 going into 1995, I had, um, I didn't get to go to the New Year's dance because I asked my counselor if I could, uh, have my hairstylist come in and fix my hair and she said no princess and whatever. So, I had read all these Michael Crichton books while I was in treatment. And um, I went up to the counter, I said, I read like all of them, I said, do you guys have anything good to read there? And he took this book and he like threw it over, right? And he goes, yeah, why don't you try this one? And I hadn't touched any of, I mean, you're, when you go into treatment, you're given, you know, uh, both the, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and the Narcotic, Narcotics Anonymous text. And um, I hadn't read any of them, I hadn't even opened the book. So, in the last page, um, of the basic text, there's this part, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, I know there's a lot of you out there that don't like my crying, I don't really care, but this is the part right here that saved my life because when I read this, um, I was like, um, I want that, like I want that. Um, Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to you or come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. And I read that line, happy destiny, and I wanted it. I just talked about this not too long ago, I think, on a vlog. Like, I, I read that line and I wanted it so bad. I was like, I'm not happy. Like, I'm miserable. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm lying. I'm cheating. I'm manipulating. I'm tired. I'm so tired. And um, I read that and I thought, other people have something that I don't have. Is it really so simple as a stupid book and just not picking up day to day? I mean, can I do that? I can't. I don't even know if I can do that. And I did it, and here I am, you know, like, hearing that road, uh, trudging the road of happy destiny, like, just hearing that, it's gonna stop, I'll be right back. But hearing that line, you know, just that line, trudging the road of happy destiny, like, I don't even know that I knew what that meant. I just know that I visualized this road and these people, like, walking down it, and they just were, like, holding hands and laughing, and I know that that wasn't the road that I was walking down because I was miserable, and I was tired, and I was scared, and just nobody, I, I just felt like nobody cared about me anymore, and I felt worthless, and I felt like a piece of shit, you know? So to anybody out there, you know, I don't feel like that today. I don't believe in any of those things that I just said. I know people care about me. I know people love me today. I know I'm worthy. I know I'm a good person. I know I put good out there into the world. And um, you don't have to continue to live that life, you know. There are 12-step programs for everything. There's 12 programs for alcoholics and addicts and, you know, specifically for marijuana, specifically for heroin, cocaine, Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sex Addicts and Love Addicts Anonymous, you know, uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics, Codependents, uh, Al-Anon, Naranon, Al-Anon and Naranon are 12-step programs for friends and family members of alcoholics and addicts. Um, you know, ACOA is Adult Children of Alcoholics. Uh, I mean, there just goes on and on and on and on and on. There's so many people out there to help you, to get the help that you need. You don't have to be alone. And I didn't know that, you know? Like, I just didn't know that when I was out there in like my own sickness and misery. I knew a lot of people that were doing the same things that I was doing, but I didn't know anybody out there was doing something different that was clean and sober. I didn't, I didn't know anybody. You know, I had seen, a, met a few people along the way, you know, that, but I didn't have anybody in my immediate life 
that was working a program and staying clean and sober, nobody. And that's why it's important for me to get on video and talk about it so that people can see in their daily life somebody that lives it. Not just, I went to treatment 20 years ago, not just somebody that, you know, stopped using and is a dry alcoholic or whatever, but I'm talking about somebody that lives it, goes to meetings, has a sponsor, works a program, went through the shit, did the deal, did, you know, walked the walk, so you can see the benefits of it, so that somebody out there can see it, so that if somebody out there has a brother, sister, mother, father, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, friend, that's going through it, or yourself, that you don't lose hope, that you too, you know, can be restored to sanity. And I think it's, you know, like, for me, that's important, and that's why it's important for me to weave that through all of my messages, you know, of what I do, and that's why I, I don't hide from it, and I talk about it in my videos, and, I, and I'm, you know, not a representative of 12-step programs, I'm a representative of Peter Mon's recovery, period, you know, I don't speak for the, the great masses, but I can talk about, you know, how those things have affected me, and they saved my life, it saved my fucking life. So anyway, God, this got real weird, didn't it? And I was talking about bereavement and my mom's master's degree and my grandfather uh, working at... So, I, did I ever even finish that? He was he worked at Thunderbird, which is now like one of the coolest bars in Indianapolis because they reopened it about 10 years ago. And you know what's really weird? The guy that bought it is supposedly like he doesn't drink or use drugs. And he has like... Uh, like cool fun drinks for people that don't drink on his menu. They're like non-alcoholic drinks. That, that would have been a lot easier to say, wouldn't it? Ugh. All right, you guys, listen, I'm gonna get off here and go home and read a little bit before I go to bed. And um, I love you and I will see you tomorrow. Get ready, because the Las Vegas vlogs are coming. Bye.